Good evening, everybody. I'm Maine Castillo. I'm Town Hall's Program Manager. On behalf of Town Hall Seattle and Urban Native Education Alliance, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's live stream presentation with artist and residence Haley Teofi. To start our program, Chayton, a youth of Urban Native Education Alliance, will read our land acknowledgement. Welcome, Chayton. Um, hello, uh, Chayton. Amachiapi, the Koto Kumashkaka, Ate Waegi, Matthew Remley, Chiapi, Ina Waegi, Rebecca Remley, Chiapi, Na Seattle, Awati. Hi, my name is Chayton, and we acknowledge that we are in the homeland of Chief Seattle's um, Duwamish tribe of Indians, the first people of this land. The Duwamish are the first Indian tribe named in the 1855. Point Elliott Treaty title on January 22nd, 1855. Uh, Chief Seattle was the first signatory on the Point Elliott Treaty at Mukitio. Uh, three other chiefs signed the Point Elliott Treaty on behalf of the Duwamish tribe. The Duwamish homeland extends from Lakes uh, Sammamish. Uh, west to Elliott Bay and from Mukilteo, uh south to Federal Way, a total of 54,700 acres. The Snoqualmie, uh, Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot tribes are also sovereign nations indigenous to Puget Sound. Uh, many people living at these sovereign nations and elsewhere are descendants of the Duwamish tribe and have ancestral ties to this land. We raise our hands to honor Chief Seattle's Duwamish tribe of Indians and all descendants of the Duwamish tribe. We thank them for their hospitality uh, as the first people of the land and for continuing use of natural resources. <laughs> Thank you, Chayton. Thank you, Chayton. I really appreciate that so much. Thank you for joining us for this program. Um, I'd like to also thank our audience for tuning in. Town Hall is proud to be a community-focused organization and a place where we can share and sustain ideas and creativity, even if that means we can't gather in person. I'd like to thank Haley for appearing tonight to help make that possible. And Haley is gonna be in conversation tonight with Jack and Kim. They'll share more about themselves later. Uh, Town Hall will be continuing to produce virtual content this fall, and many of our past talks are available in video or podcast form in our digital media library. Town Hall is adding new events and podcasts every day. Upcoming programs include Senator Sherrod Brown with Executive Dow Constantine about the legacy of progressive senators who preceded him, Alex Ross with Ann Powers talking about art and politics, and Wagern, Stuart Getty and Max Delson with a primer on gender expression, and many more. Town Hall and the nonprofit community at large have been put under significant strain due to the event cancellations and ever-changing landscape. We hope you will consider extending your generosity to help support us during this difficult time by making a donation by clicking the donate button at the bottom of your screen or becoming a member. You can make a donation online or text Town Hall to 44321 to give. For viewers who want to watch this broadcast with closed captioning, we recommend viewing the stream via our YouTube page. To enable real-time closed captioning, click the CC button at the bottom right corner of the video player. The video will be available for rewatching immediately following tonight's broadcast. Tonight's presentation will be about 60 minutes, including Q&A. Haley will select from those submitted in the Ask a Question field at the bottom center of your screen. You can also vote on which questions will be addressed by clicking the arrow next to the question to upvote it. We cannot guarantee that we'll be able to address every question, but we will try to get to as many as possible. Please keep your questions concise and in the form of a question. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our Arts and Culture series is supported by Four Culture, Arts Fund, Office of Arts and Culture, and Wincote Foundation Northwest. Finally, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, so I'd like to thank all of our members watching tonight. 
Haley Teofi is a member of the Quileut Nation, a visual artist, and Seattle's premier Native American drag queen. They use their queer Native experiences to inform their unique brand of drag. They completed an artist residency last year with the Yaha and the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture. Their public art can be seen at King Street Station and the Northwest Film Forum. They aim to bring healing to indigenous communities and to show everyone that indigenous queers are still here and are stronger and more beautiful than colonized minds can imagine. You can find out more about their work at HaleyTeofi.com. Teofi's art installation for Town Hall is the subject of tonight's talk. Please join me in welcoming Haley Teofi. Hey, hat to talk to you, uh, Quilla as Doran Remington, her hat, Haley Teafi, uh, Ka as, uh, Cheryl Remington, Abba as, uh, Shirley Cleveland, Yikha Abba as, Sarah Ward, Haley Quilliut. Um, yeah, so just sort of recapping. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jordan Remington, also better known as Haley Teafi. I am a member of the Ward Woodruff family of the Quilliut tribe. Um, yeah, and so I'm going to share this little presentation with y'all. Um, and we're going to talk about land acknowledgements um, along with my art today. And so, okay. and begin. great. Um, so I'm sort of informally calling this uh, land acknowledgements, the good, the bad, and the land back. <laughs> um, my own little personal joke for me. Um, and so again, just sort of thinking about sort of my identities, I always say you have, just have to remember your cues. Um, I am queer, cool you, and a drag queen. Um, and so just sort of a little bit of my background in terms of art, I've been doing drag now for about three years um, and got into doing more like visual artwork um, through that, um, having to create my own clothing and whatnot. Everything you see in this photo, for instance, is all clothing that I made myself. Um, a sort of traditional button blanket, which we'll get into is a little bit of an art form. Um, that was sort of borrowed by Kuliuts from another land. Um, and you can see a more contemporary skirt here. All of this was like original pieces made completely from scratch. And so sort of getting into that sort of fabric um, design, I sort of consider myself to be a fabric fiber artist um, as my primary, primary like visual mediums um, with obviously my big one being performance drag. Um, but I also do sort of like digital design work as well in terms of using Coast Salish and other art forms. And so I want to sort of talk a little bit about the Coast Salish as a terminology. Um, I know we use it a lot, especially here in the Seattle area um, and more broadly throughout the Puget Sound. Um, and so I just sort of want to talk on its origins. So on this map on the left, you can see a, um, these are all the different Coast Salish languages. And so Coast Salish itself um, is a terminology that sort of came out of linguistics um, as a language family. So all of those languages that you see on this map are part of the Coast Salish language family. And then that terminology has been sort of moved over to also include things um, in terms of like Coast Salish art and Coast Salish cultures. Um, and if you look at this map, Quileute is located here. You will see that it's not considered a Coast Salish language. Quileute is the last remaining language of what is, um, linguists call the Chimacon language family. So it's considered to be its own sort of isolate language. Um, our neighbors to the north, so on the west side of Vancouver Island, and also the Macaw tribe speak uh, New Channel languages. Um, and one thing I want to always caution people, I mean, you will see this um, with both languages and also territories, you'll see sort of these like indigenous maps. Um, and I want to just like caution you that although they show things as being these sort of like hard set boundaries between different tribes or different languages, right? We know that pre-contact and pre-colonization, everything was a lot more like blurred than it is today. So when we think about the Kuliuts, for instance, as a tribe, um, and we think about like the Coast Salish term. The Quileutes historically pre-contact had a art form that was more aligned and a cultural practices that were more aligned with their Coast Salish neighbors. However, as we sort of had to rebuild ourselves after colonization, we got a lot more influence from our sort of Northern neighbors who helped us um, fill in gaps in knowledge that we had. So you see in sort of modern Quileute art forms, a more heavy influence of New Channel's culture. And so I always say, like, I think Kuli's are a really good sort of tribe to use as sort of thinking about this, 
thinking that we're in that gray area, sort of between new channels, which in terms of like art form is sometimes called West Coast style art form. Um, and the Coast Salish style art form. So I, as a Kulu artist, I try to sort of practice both. You'll see me do Coast Salish art forms, but you'll also see the more form line style that you would see from tribes along, say, like the west coast of Vancouver Island. And now getting sort of into like land acknowledgements. Um, one thing that you'll hear a lot of from people is sort of talking about land acknowledgements is that they are rooted in less sort of like Native American traditions. Now, I will say I oftentimes hear <laughs> particularly white academics sort of say that in a very vague sense of like, we are trying to modernize sort of Native protocols. And so sort of thinking about like our land, at least within my culture, like coastal Native, our land acknowledgements sort of rooted in our sort of practices, traditional practices. And I think, at least for me, the answer is, Sort of, maybe, possibly. Um, and so I'm just going to sort of run through some practices that we do here in the Pacific Northwest that I think most closely align with land acknowledgements. Um, and then we'll kind of go into sort of how that could play out in sort of more modern contexts. Or well, not modern, but within sort of the westernized context. Obviously, natives, we are still modern people. I am still here. Um, and so I want to talk about canoe landings. Um, so our previous photo you saw was from the uh, Paddle to Nisqually 2016. Um, canoe culture has been a huge part of revitalizing um, our traditions here in the Pacific Northwest and is spreading to other parts of the country as well. Um, but I kind of want to talk about the process in which you would land a canoe. Um, so here we see a coastline. And let's say you are in a canoe and you are wanting to land on this beach here. Because um, let's say you're heading to, yeah, tribal journeys or something. What you kind of do is you'd come up towards the coast and you kind of swoop in at a very soft angle um, until you're essentially traveling parallel to the coastline. And then as you're traveling parallel, kind of passing the coast where you want to land, you would raise your paddles up to the sky and just sort of glide and coast for a while. Um, this is a sign of like friendly intentions that you're sort of coming peacefully, um, just sort of like signals to the people on the land. After this, you're going to do a little bit of a circle, and then you're finally going to come in um, for your landing. However, you're not going to immediately land on the land. Instead, you will sort of wait offshore for someone from the host tribe to come out and greet you. Um, someone from your canoe would then stand up. They would introduce who they are. So if this could be what tribe you are from. If your canoe is of a specific family, you would mention like this is like we might mention, for instance, if it's at all the Ward Woodruff family in a canoe, we might say this is the Ward Woodruff family. Um, and then also, if you have an intertribal canoe, you'd mention um, sort of the name of your canoe family as well as what tribes are represented within the canoe. You'd also state your intentions. So oftentimes, when you think about, for instance, with tribal journeys, um, your intentions usually are to come and like share songs and dance. Um, and share food. Um, and so that's something that you had mentioned. You state your intentions as you are asking permission to come onto the land. And then finally, you ask permission from the host family to come onto the land. <clears throat> and then after you ask permission, the host family will sort of respond back to you and welcome you to shore. Um, and so the way I sort of view this sort of protocol that we have here, um, is a lot about a asking for permission and consent um, to the use of the host tribe's lands. When I think about sort of the intentions, stating your intentions, what I see that as is like making a promise that while you are on this land, that you will conduct yourself in a like friendly and respectful way. Um, so making that promise, and then also stating who you are to hold yourself and your tribe or your family or canoe family accountable to being to holding yourself in that respectful manner while you're on someone else's land. And so this is the closest thing, like when I sort of think about land acknowledgements and thinking about sort of like what is an indigenous, like a possible indigenous route to them, at least here within sort of like the Pacific Northwest uh, coastal tribes, like this is sort of what I think of as our protocols that most closely align with what a land acknowledgement is. I do also want to mention though that, you know, in the United States alone, there's almost 500 and 70 um, federally recognized Native American tribes, as well as unrecognized tribes. 
Um, and then some of those tribes have multiple cultural groups. So there's a lot of different cultures that exist, even within just America, let alone Canada and the other parts of the Americas. Um, and so it's possible to that other cultures have other traditions, very similar to land acknowledgements. But I'm just sort of pulling from my own experience as a coastal native, um, someone from the Pacific Northwest, as to our protocols closely aligned with land acknowledgements. And with that said, I kind of want to trans, we're going to kind of move into what is like the westernized context of them. Because um, I'm sure if most of us have heard land acknowledgements done, I mean, y'all just heard one today. Um, and if you haven't heard one done, I would very much question what events you're going to. Um, but they sort of came out of Vancouver, British Columbia, primarily, at least here within the Pacific Northwest. Uh, they started in Canada specifically, and it's oftentimes pointed to what was called the Truth and Reconciliation Council, uh, which was this commission that came together to try and figure out how do we mend the bonds between, or like mend the relationship between the Canada and its First Nations. And they came up with approximately 74, I believe, recommendations on how to sort of mend those relationships. And although land acknowledgements are not specifically mentioned as a part of those 74 recommendations, several of the recommendations have to do with uh, recognizing the sovereignty of the, of the indigenous nations, as well as recognizing our relationship to the land. And so that's sort of like one place that's pointed to as to where a land acknowledgements, at least from this sort of like Western colonial context, started to come out from. So the idea of being is about healing relationships between so the Western governments and their indigenous nations. And one of the big areas that we sort of see this, especially start to pop up in say Vancouver or Victoria is in sort of that very much like educational setting. So thinking about, you know, you show up to a university, you're all excited to hear about like cross laminated timbers, environmental effects on construction of houses and you're all excited to hear about that and then there was this hard stop moment of just like hold up <laughs> before we do anything else we want you to think about what it means to be on this land that you are on and i think when we started when land acknowledgement started first coming out they were these very disruptive acts of trying to really take people who maybe wouldn't be thinking about this kind of stuff wouldn't, be, wouldn't know whose land they're on or wouldn't be thinking about what that means. Um, and trying to force, almost in some ways, kind of force them to really contemplate what that means. Um, so when you think about sort of like that being the disruptive act, and sort of as we think about the evolution of land acknowledgements, trying to sort of keep that rooted and the fact that it was meant to be very disruptive. But I also want to say, I also want to acknowledge that I think oftentimes, especially here in America, we can really idealize what's going on in Canada. Um, and in some ways, they have done better aspects with the First Nations, but in also other ways they have not. And I'm not going to go into all of this. That would be a whole presentation in and of itself. Um, but in terms of like what's happened with that Truth and Reconciliation, Commission's recommendations. Um, there have been protests recently in like 2019 and 2020 um, claiming that reconciliation is dead. And so if you want to learn more about that, I would recommend Googling reconciliation is dead. You can find a lot of articles um, about sort of like what's happening there and how those recommendations have not been met um, with a lot of the Canadian First Nations. So going back, <laughs> to the sort of idea of like the good, the bad, and the land back. I, <laughs> for myself and for everyone watching, take a little deep breath, because we're about to go into um, some examples of land acknowledgements that I've seen. Um, and there will be one in particular that we will dissect as to why it was, it gave me such a visceral reaction to it while I was there. Um, so let's talk about Forterra's ampersand event. Um, so this happened in 2018, and I happened to get like a free ticket to the event, and so I was there, present for this. 
Um, and I had happened to have found like probably the only other native <laughs> at that event. Um, and we were sitting together. And for context, Ampersand is this big event that Forterra throws, every, I think, every year. Uh, and they rent out the Moore Theater. So you're in this giant theater, 2,000 plus people um, getting ready to do this event. And as you can sort of see on the right here, we have this little band that's playing. So that's just some context. They're playing some music. Um, and then I'm just going to click through some slides here. And it is the land acknowledgment that they did for their event. And what I should also say, because you don't have the audio for this, but as someone who's there, this last slide came up and the Moore Theater just erupted in people cheering and clapping. <laughs> and one thing I will say, first off, if you are not an indigenous person, I'm gonna say, do not cheer or clap for land acknowledgments, <laughs> at least in my opinion. This is, I will say this is my opinion here. Um, but when we think about if land acknowledgments are supposed to be something that's supposed to make you contemplate sort of what it means to be here on indigenous land, um, and more specifically here in Seattle on the Coast Salish land, land of Duwamish, Duwamish, Muckleshoot, uh, you, I am quite perplexed often when people start cheering for land acknowledgments. If it is supposed to be an acknowledgement of what it means to be here, if it's supposed to be an acknowledgement of the fact that you that you have benefited from the removal and genocide of indigenous people, I've just never fully understood why people would clap for that. Um, and it's something that I see happen a lot, especially here in Seattle and as land acknowledgements become more and more popular. Um, so just like with that said, <laughs> first off, I, in my opinion at least, stop cheering and clapping for land acknowledgements. I know one time I was at an event and started to give a land acknowledgement. I'll kind of go into this event a little bit later. Um, but people were cheering so loud that people, no one heard whose land I said we were even on. Um, so, <laughs> but moving on, what I want to do is sort of break down why, for me at least, this land acknowledgement was so frustrating. Um, and I will say I leaned <laughs> me and the friend that I was at this event with like leaned over to each other and we were like, seriously, was that it? And like, that's all they did. Um, and so we'll break this down. Okay, so first off, uh, with this sort of before we get started. Again, sort of like another thing, thinking back to sort of the original um, intents of land acknowledgements when they were first starting up, being this very disruptive act. I think one thing that I've seen with land acknowledgements happen increasingly is they've become more and more just this uh, little thing that you sort of say while you're telling people like where the bathrooms are and if there's a fire, you need to find the emergency exits out there. And by the way, we're on these people's land. <clears throat> and the more it becomes this sort of like boilerplate, like that it's in that section of like every event that we sort of, most of us kind of ignore. And so I think that's another thing as we sort of think about land acknowledgements as they're becoming increasingly common. Um, sort of how do we sort of keep them to still have an impact and stay in the forefront of people's mind and not something that they just sort of tune out for because it's in buried with a bunch of stuff that they always tune out for. <laughs> Also, this is a little thing, but they had this whole huge screen. You could have made it bigger. I know, okay. And then moving on to sort of the second slide. Again, I'll sort of break this down. So let's take a moment to acknowledge. Again, and this is something, this I didn't necessarily think about in the moment when I was at this event, but as I was sort of, you know, thinking about land acknowledgements I've heard um, in, pre in preparing for this presentation, um, I was like looking at this phrase, and I guess one of the things that sort of frustrated me with this is that, again, land, land acknowledgements, I feel oftentimes have these sort of strange time constraints almost added to them. In this case, you know, like, let's take a moment. There's oftentimes this little, like, we're going to do this right now um, sort of wordage in there that I find interesting. Um, I tried to find a statistic last night, but I couldn't find it. But there was something like, 
three and five natives um, think about sort of the loss of land um, on a daily basis. And so I guess when seeing this kind of wording in land acknowledgments, one of my thought processes is if I have to sort of carry this um, like on a daily basis, why is it that you only have to sort of think of, contemplate this for just a hot second um, when native people have to sort of grapple with this pretty much 24 seven. And then I'm also going to sort of go into the word acknowledge. Now I know it's a land acknowledgement and that's this point. <laughs> and I'm not saying that you shouldn't put acknowledge in your land acknowledgement. Um, but what I would sort of like to recognize is that acknowledge isn't action. It's something that you do, but it's not actionably changing the outcomes, right? It's just recognizing that something exists. And so when we think about land acknowledgements, I think sometimes people can get a little high. They, I've seen organizations think that a land acknowledgement is almost like the end all be all of what can be done for Native people, or think that this is some amazing great thing for Native people. When really it is, and at least, in, again, I'll say in my opinion, there's a lot of Native people out there don't necessarily hold all of my opinions. But at least in my opinion, an acknowledgement of, again, the force of forced removal and like genocide of our people, acknowledging that is really base zero. <laughs> it's like base level um, what an organization can do. And so I think, at least I've seen organizations sort of get to this point of where they worked really hard to get this land acknowledgement done, and then they kind of stop at that point. And so we sort of need to realize that if you're going to sort of acknowledge that you are benefiting from having access to these lands, that then you also need to think about what actionable steps you can take to try and repair um, the fact that you're benefiting from land that was you know, forcibly taken in many cases. And then this. This is what really got me and my friend who were at this event. Um, so again, this event happens at the Moore Theater in downtown Seattle. And to only recognize that it was on indigenous land, at least to us, just sort of screamed laziness. Like, for a land acknowledgement, the more specific you can be, I would say, the better. And then also, again, thinking about what is the goal of these land acknowledgements? What are you teaching people? The fact, I just can't imagine that anyone saw we are on indigenous land and actually learned something from that statement. And so making sure that you are specific enough, and I've seen, like I have a sweatshirt that says you are on native land. That was made by a native company who ships sweatshirts, those sweatshirts all over the country. And so that sort of makes sense, like in that specific case to be a little generic. But when you are holding an event that is physically located in a space, you can do better than just acknowledging indigenous or native land. We can be more specific than that. Okay, <laughs> now that I've sort of <laughs> harped on the ampersand event land acknowledgement for a while, um, I would like to just bring up this example of what I call the best land acknowledgement that wasn't a land acknowledgement. <laughs> um, some of you may have heard of the Portland Arts Organization, um, Yale Union. Um, so they are, they sort of run this building that exists down in Portland. And over the next year, that organization is actually going to dissolve itself um, and transfer that land over to the Native American Arts and Culture Foundation, which is a native art, native run arts nonprofit um, based out of Portland. So they're actually physically giving the land back, um, literally. And I absolutely, I, I love, this, um, if for nothing else, other than setting a precedent, I think oftentimes when I've had conversations with organizations about like land acknowledgements and sort of what you can do to like benefit native people, um, you know, you sort of get asked that question and then, you know, 
I will oftentimes sort of respond with like, well, you could give the land back. Um, and then people will sometimes like laugh or sort of think I'm joking. And it's like, no, seriously, you can give the land back. Um, and so I do love this example is setting the precedent. I mean, at least now we can say that like other organizations have done it. Um, and so it really just sort of raises the bar as to like what it means to recognize the land that you're on and sort of like how can you, how can an organization sort of support indigenous and native people? So I just want to touch um, briefly, this is native, these are some questions from Native Gov, which is a nonprofit organization based out of Canada. Um, and sort of the questions that they have around giving like for organizations or people who are giving a land acknowledgement, questions that you should sort of be asking yourself. And really it all just kind of comes down to, in a way a little bit of like, what's the point of this land acknowledgement, right? So like, why are we doing this? And like, what's the end goal? Again, sort of thinking about what is the tangible takeaway for the people who are hearing your land acknowledgement? And this is something where I will say, I think the audience that you have sort of makes a difference here. Um, I am someone who I do not always do a land acknowledgement for events that I sort of run or am a part of. Um, it kind of depends on the land, land acknowledgement. Oftentimes I just try and um, you know pay native people to do their thing. Um, and I consider that to be in some ways a land acknowledgement. Um, but thinking about being in spaces, I have done more traditional land acknowledgements when I've realized that people, the audience of that organization that I'm speaking to um, may literally not know whose land they're on. And at that point in time, it's like, okay, we'll get you <laughs> at least an incremental step forward. Um, and so in that case, I will do like a real land acknowledgement or you know, more traditional land acknowledgement. Um, so thinking about sort of like, what's the end goal? Are you trying to educate people? Are you trying to call people to action? Which I think is probably the better, more ideal option. Um, and then thinking about like what the impact will be. Is this land acknowledgement going to actually benefit native people? And I think we can kind of talk about whether land acknowledgements are for native people or for non-native people. Um, and that's maybe a question also to ask yourself as if you're an organization writing a land acknowledgement. Um, and then I would also add my own question of sort of like, what do you, we have to offer? Um, in sort of the case of like the Yale Union, do you have, do you control land? Um, and if you do, have you thought about giving it back? <laughs> um, but you know, not all organizations own land. So sort of thinking about sort of like what resources do you have to offer um, to native people? Again, sort of thinking about if acknowledgement is sort of like base level, acknowledging that you've benefited from um, the taking of tribal land, um, how do you sort of then benefit, use that sort of benefit to nowadays benefit the existing people? And so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about some examples of I'm gonna say land acknowledgement in quotes. None of these were like strict land acknowledgements, um, but some of the artwork that I have done in terms of acknowledging land. So this was for the Yahoo closing. Um, I performed at their closing event. And so for my first piece I did, um, I called it Treaties and Territories. And it was a mixture of, this is America by Childish Gambino, um, a song called Treaties by Frank Long, who is a um, Sioux rapper, um, that was talking about um, treaties and like treaties being broken. Um, and so this is sort of how I started. I started actually with um, this land is your land and sort of walked my way up to the stage and then unfurled the flag. And so my point, my goal here for, in this case was that it was in the space um, near King Street Station um, this event happened, well, at least this performance piece happened during sort of like commute hours. So we had all these people sort of like moving around, um, just trying to like moving around the day, like trying to get home and sort of thinking about, okay, like how do we sort of be disruptive in this moment and to try and make people sort of contemplate 
or hopefully make people think about what it means to be on this land. Um, yeah, and so doing that in sort of a very, a little bit of an in your face kind of way. <clears throat> this is another sort of art piece that I've done. Um, I created this as sort of a response to um, Mayor Jenny Durkin and SPD doing land acknowledgements um, while they were talking about talking to our protesters. You can, on my Instagram account, there's a full description here that we can read through, that you can read through. Um, I'm not going to read it, <laughs> but there's some profanity in it, so we're not going to. Um, but sort of, again, when I was sort of talking about like the canoe landings, thinking about sort of what it means to live respectfully on this land, um, and how that also, that doesn't necessarily just mean being respectful to native people, although obviously that as well, but also being respectful just in general to the people who exist on this land. Um, so also respecting black lives. So if you don't respect black lives, your land acknowledgement, you have, your land acknowledgement is a bit of a lie because if you are in, trying to have promised that you will be acting in a respectful way, which is what I see land acknowledgements being, um, at least coming from sort of my like coastal native perspective, um, then yeah, you have to be, you can't say you're gonna be treating people with respect and then tear gassing them, my personal opinion. <clears throat> and so now that we've gone through all that fun stuff, um, sort of thinking about getting working with town halls land acknowledgement and creating an art piece to go along with it um this is sort of like the big question that i had going into this work is thinking about how can an art piece add meaning and add weight and it's sort of like actionables um to a land acknowledgement so yeah thinking about the actionables and also sort of you know again kind of going back to that like if we, as in the non-natives, have benefited from um, the taking of native land. Then, you know, how do we use what resources organizations have to benefit native people? And so, again, what I kind of want to talk about is going back to sort of rooting myself in this space. Um, again, I'm a Kulu artist. My territories are if you. You know, if you're at Alki, if you're at Golden Gardens or downtown Seattle waterfront, and you look across the Olympic Mountains on the other side of the Olympic Mountains, that's my territory. Um, and, you know, the Quileutes, we would come over into the Puget Sound too. We had, I, like, we had relationships with those in like Nisqually and various other tribes of Puget Sound. Um, so we were not like strangers to this land, um, but also recognizing that, you know, I'm, a little, I'm like adjacent to, but not from this land. And so this being sort of the context in which we're working in, being Seattle. And I wanted to make sure that this project was something that could benefit um, members of the tribes and peoples who are more, whose territory this would be within, Seattle would be within. And then also thinking about what Town Hall has to offer. If you think of sort of Town Hall as kind of thinking about it as a space for um, learning, sharing knowledge, um, and for the community gatherings. <laughs> Doesn't this sound nice? If we could all just gather together again. Um, but thinking of it as a space for that, um, and sort of like what, how can that space be used as um, to benefit Native people? And so, so what I came up with, this is sort of the draft, this is a digital draft design of what my idea was. Um, so thinking about Town Hall as a physical space, you can see in this draft, the longhouse style design that is sort of framing um, on top of a Coast Salish style weave pattern. Um, and this would be like wool weaving, so for blankets. Um, and then what I wanted to do was to sort of show indigenous people coming together to sort of reclaim space within Town Hall um, and sort of show yeah, us sort of coming together, sharing, and holding collective power to sort of be able to share our our knowledge, our wisdoms, um, in sort of whatever way we see fit. Um, and yeah, so sort of trying to think about how 
hopefully coming together and sort of indigenizing the space a bit. <clears throat> so I'll sort of go into a little bit about how I did that. <laughs> and so one thing that happened, I sort of put out this artist, this call for artists. Um, and I just sort of sent this out on, you know, social media and tried to sort of blast it out there. Um, I put together a small application um, and also like an info paper um, that people could read. And what I will say is that from that process, I got a grand total of zero applicants. Um, and it was kind of, I had a great conversation with my mom in which she was just like, Jordan, <laughs> you know how this works. <laughs> like, you can't just like put it out there into the world and expect native people to come to you. Like you have to go to them. Um, and so I had sort of changed my approach there, um, realizing that within this section, I was sort of working from a westernized perspective on um, working with native people and yeah, just having to go back to my own personal knowledge. Um, and so I started reaching out personally to a lot of the art people that I knew um, just be like, hey, do you know anyone from um, the local tribes or local communities and who might be interested in working with me um, on this project and sort of getting recommendations and then doing personalized outreach um, to people. So, and then that's actually how I found all the artists um, that I worked with for this project was through that personal asking. And so that's something to thinking about for those who want to work with native people is realizing that you can't really ever expect us to come to you. Um, a, we're busy people. There's a lot of people trying to engage with natives these days. Um, and so you really have to go to them um, with the ask and sort of, I mean, obviously leave things up flexible. Don't be too prescribed. Um, and I can talk a little bit too that when I was initially coming up with the vision for this project, I was kind of pretty specific about I how so like, well, in my vision, I have Coast Salish art designs, Coast Salish um, face designs specifically. Um, and then realizing that I had to sort of like let up on that. Like if I was an artist um, and also just being like an indigenous person, it should be however um, those people want to see um, their identities and their cultures reflected within this space. Um, so trying to open that up a little bit more to, to interpretation. So offering that if people felt like there was another design that represented them better, um, that they could do that. Or if they have different mediums, also working with people, um, yeah, to incorporate the mediums that they work with. Uh, and so for this project, um, I worked with Tyson Simmons, who's Muckleshoot. Um, and so this is the face design that he, after some conversations, he agreed that a face design sounded good. Um, and so he sort of created this face design that would be then used on the RP, the final art piece that I made, which is a tapestry design, and we'll so sh show some photos of that later. Um, and then I also worked with Jack, who is Duwamish, um, and Jack is in this call, so I'm going to stop sharing, and we will let Jack speak for himself. Okay, hi, I'm I'm Jack Oliver Trotman. Um, I'm a member of the Duwamish tribe. Uh, and I, my primary medium is uh, photography. And I guess, uh, so for this, um, I, I guess my approach is that I really feel that um, uh, like depicting uh, indigenous peoples like me or like Duwamish people are using contemporary technology um, to project a world like their own stories, culture, and language. And um, my my work, um, I, I try I try to bring attention to that. Um, so I'm I'm not using like traditional like Duwamish. Uh, mediums of, of like artistic expression um in, in that like in some ways my use of like these contemporary technical supports like like using a projector i'm, I'm like forgetting 
old Duwamish mediums of cultural expression. Um, but I'm doing this to ensure that the Duwamish are are not forgotten. So that's that's kind of my approach. Um, so kind of what I like to do this my piece is I'll, I'll, I'll um, take like a single exposure um, of the photograph and I'll um, project an image on another image on onto that. Um, and then by having like a, a single image with um, with multiple projected images within it, I'm, I'm trying to draw attention also to like the concepts of like projection and like how um, also frequently in the history of photography of, of indigenous peoples, um, like uh, the colonizers, they, they, someone else like has come in and, and like sort of projected their own, their own sort of vision of like what, um, what, you know, like this tribe is supposed to look like as maybe nothing to do with their culture at all. Like a good example of that might be like Edward S. Curtis. And, um, and then this, this sort of style of photography, I think, I think very much still happens today with how, how photography is used, you know, just as a, a tool to pillage the, the cultural um, history of uh, um, indigenous peoples and so I'm really trying to draw attention to that with this idea of, of projection. So that's why I, I, I like to use projectors. So, so for this, this piece, um, I actually did this, you know, like uh, just re very recently when, when it was very, very smoky out and I couldn't go, couldn't go outside because I'm in, I'm in Portland right now. And it was like too smoky. I thought I went outside. I gag. So I just said, "Do, do this in, inside my own house." Um, so, so yeah. Um, so that's kind of what I did. Is I, I was in in my bathroom. And I used a bunch of mirrors and sort of thinking about you know all these reflections going on in, a, in that photograph as well. I was trying to think about that. Um, yeah, and so I, I used the long exposure and I'm sort of like looking a little bit, bit ghostly and I'm just trying to, you know, connect with the ghosts of the past too, a little bit here. Um, yeah, I think that about covers my approach to this, to this project. Um, oh yeah, one thing I wanted to talk about that, um, based on what was said earlier is that I think you did it like, a, it was a really amazing job talking about like land acknowledgements. And I feel like I learned a lot. One thing I wanted to talk a little bit about um, uh, uh, tribal journeys. Um, so so I have um, participated in at least like 10 tribal journeys um, as a member of the Oliver Canoe family. And my, my, my great uncle, uh, Emmett Oliver, um, was one of the founders of uh, the tribal journeys. And so that's one of the things I wanted to basically want to mention is that tribal journeys is, is a contemporary invention. It, it's, not, it's not really based on any sort of like old or ancient tradition, it's, it's very much a contemporary invention to keep to keep our culture alive and relevant in, in these in these times. And I guess I just wanted to draw attention to that. And I think that's important to talk about. And I, and I really love that about tribal journeys, about how how there's like sort of uncertainty and how and how we're sort of like we're constantly having to to improvise. And I think that's really important. All right, I think I'm the. That's about it. That's all I have to say for right now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. I'm just going to quickly go back to. Um, yeah, and then so what we're going to do. I'm just going to finish up. 
kind of talking about the overall finished piece. Um, and so this is the photo that we're going to use from Jack to put onto uh, the final piece. And so one thing that, and from more of like a technical, how do you sort of do art perspective methods, um, this photo will be printed onto a fabric. I'm essentially going to do it in the same way that you would print your own like custom made fabric. Um, so with that said, I do not currently have it yet. Um, it is on order. Um, but this is sort of the photo of the art piece that I've created um, and where it's at so far. Um, so just like briefly, because I think it's about sort of the te techniques used here. Um, so size-wise, it's approximately um, four feet wide by three feet tall. Um, and it's an all, like it's a fabric applique. So essentially what that means is you just sort of sew fabric pieces on top of each other. Um, I did change up the weaving design that is in the background to more of a chevron rather than the diamond that I originally had in the plan. Um, and that had to just do with like spacing, like the size of it, the diamond didn't translate very well. Um, there was going to be about like two diamonds on the entire thing, or I think like one and a half diamonds. Um, so we sw switched to a chevron over two, under two um, style, like Coast Salish wool weaving design. And this is all made from wool fabrics itself, kind of trying to make, do a little bit of a nod to um, wool blanket weaving. And yeah, and so you can see on the right here is uh, Tyson's face design. On the left is my own design that I put on there as um, sort of a representation of also recognizing that within this modern context, um, there's a lot of people, a lot of different native people who live in Seattle. So sort of representing, um, I use myself to sort of represent the urban native community. Um, and then in the future, so one gap that I do recognize with this art piece is that um, there wasn't a Suquamish artist that was working on it. Um, so that's something that I will continue to work on. Um, and I've talked to, with Town Hall about this, that you know, one nice thing about this style of applique is that essentially I could add um, onto it at any point in time. Um, so I will, you know, even though my residency is like officially wrapping up, I will sort of continue to try and, and work um, with Suquamish to find an artist um, to add to this. And then we're also going to add Jack's photo into it as well. Um, but yeah, this is the, sort of the final piece. Um, this will be hanging in Town Hall's lobby at some point in time. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so I think now we will transition to me, Jack, and Kimberly. And Kimberly, if we could start, if you could just introduce yourself. <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Kimberly Dariana. I am a Mandan and a Hadatsa Maitri architect. Um, my background is in architectural design and art, and um, just happy to be on this call. My my tribes are from um, the North Dakota area, and I'm a third generation urban native. So. Um, my grandmother was my last relative to live on our on our traditional land and i grew up in bozeman montana and have been in the coast salish territories for the past seven years awesome yeah and so part of like thinking about doing this like presentation um doing this artist talk one thing that i really didn't want to do is to have it just be me giving my <laughs> opinions <laughs> on land acknowledgements. Um, and so I guess one thing that I sort of want to like throw to both of you, and I kind of figured this would be a little bit like a unstructured, just sort of conversation. I think going into this project, at least for me, there was a lot of, or actually even more towards the latter part of the project, um, really kind of thinking about like, why do we do land acknowledgements? Um, and just sort of like trying to process through like, how do we sort of like make them mean any, like how do we make them sort of like mean something and make them still relevant to today? Um, and so that's a big question, but <laughs> what I was just kind of wanting to get sort of like both of your thoughts, um, just sort of like on land acknowledgements um, and yeah, just sort of like the usefulness or how do we make them useful? Like what makes a good 
useful land acknowledgement. Jack, you can go first if you want. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. That's kind of, it's kind of a hard question. What makes a useful land acknowledgement? Um, well, I guess, I don't know. I have sort of complicated feelings about, about land acknowledgements. You know, I, I feel like, um, it's frequently that, um, you know that the indigenous peoples that um, that they construed by by you know like colonizers that um, that they have like this sort of like innate connection with nature and that this idea that they're sort of no more than like a uh, like a piece of the landscape and um, this is this sort of means that that you know like colonizers. Um, and they're sort of projecting this onto indigenous peoples that, um, and that they sort of otherize them and, um, and then to enable their, their, their conquering. Um, and so, and so, yeah, I guess the real problem for me is that, is that the land acknowledgement is that it just sort of sometimes feels a little bit like a, a euphemism for, for, um, genocide and and like pillage and so um i guess a, a useful one would would be one that's that's not a euphemism or 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 yeah i guess that's that's all i can say right now yeah <laughs> and i think Yeah, and I think it's like one of the things that, I mean, like, kind of going back to sort of what I was saying about like when people cheer for them, like I find it's like very odd. I don't know, I I really got hung up on that today. I'll be honest, as I was prepping for this like talk, <laughs> like I had this little moment, I was just like remembering the people cheering for them and I was just like, what even? Um, yeah, it's a very interesting, just like how, and I guess one thing too that I've seen is organizations sort of um, like Kim, you know, that I've worked on some land acknowledgements before um, and consulted on some. Um, and I've seen sort of almost like tone policing of like land acknowledgements that even native people have written. Um, and just sort of like I've had experiences in which trying to like help people sort of develop their land acknowledgement, I'm like kind of recommending like here's some things you could add into this to like try and make it a little bit more um, recognizing history, like trying to teach people something or um, trying to add actionable items to it. Um, and I've seen organizations sort of be like, well, we can't say that, that's too sad. That'll make people sad. <laughs> and it's just like, it's not a happy history. What do you want? <laughs> ability to like put the burden onto other people is just ridiculous like I, I hate that I really what you said about um three and five natives thinking about the loss of land daily that just was like that just really struck my soul because I'm like oh my god I do that and I feel sick about it you know like it's it's really traumatizing and just it wears you down a lot, but um, yeah, <laughs> I think land acknowledgements are important because I need I need um, non-native people to you know start to carry some of that empathy and that weight and burden and um, start to realize how important it is for us all to to go back to the knowledge and the stewardship of the teachings of places and the first people of places and i think land acknowledgement is the first step in realizing like wow we don't know anything and we have so much more to learn and to grow and to um evolve 
yeah, definitely being like the actionable, or yeah, sort of being like the first step. I mean, is like you have to sort of acknowledge something before you can <laughs> try and change it. Mm -hmm. Just yeah, recommendation to people watching: don't get stuck on the acknowledgement portion of it. Um, yeah, <clears throat> and then I guess. Some of the other things that just sort of like bringing it in terms of, I like how I said, I was like, this is going to be the portion where I just sort of like mentally process with y'all. Um, and that's exactly what is happening right now. Um, and just sort of like thinking about how, I guess sort of like who, So many, okay, who is sort of giving land acknowledgements? I think it's just like another thing, I was reading an article, I think when I took over Town Hall's um, Instagram the other day, I sort of linked to it in one of their things. Um, but there's this podcast with some people talking about land acknowledgements sort of being this coming from previously when organizations would ask Native people to sort of like come and sort of like like do a blessing or do whatever um, at the start of a thing and how like now it's like that has sort of shifted into like the sort of land acknowledgement world. Um, and just thinking about like, I mean, I think on one hand it's like great that it's like shifting responsibility off of native people to sort of like try and think about this kind of stuff. Um, but then also thinking how, like how to engage the audience in terms of that. Um, how to like make sure people are actually thinking through these processes and like engaging in that sort of like relationship building that is needed um, to sort of actualize what a land acknowledgement is trying to do. Um, I think there's, well, listening to that podcast, sort of just hearing like this idea of um, almost like it was like tokenizing to do that to Native people, which I definitely like. I hear that, and that's like I feel like that's definitely true. Um, but at the same time, that maybe not being like the best, the best step um, from that, and sort of being like it's more about incorporating Native people into like, or like incorporating Native voices into work rather than and this I feel like a lot of organizations have just sort of like shifted um, just a little almost too internally. I don't know if any of that made sense. <laughs> Good job, Jordan. <laughs> just really grasping there. <laughs> There's like a lot of abstract points that you're making and something like, okay, how do I connect the dots. Um, I think like when, with your examples that you were showing, I really loved how you could, how you described like, you know, you gave the, the example of an organization who is about um, preserving land and they have the resources to do something, like actually do something with, giving land back or, you know, doing a bigger, having a bigger gesture about land acknowledgement because acknowledgement can be, it can be so many different things. It could be like a, a work of art. It could be, um, you know, inviting people to share a meal, like all the examples you gave of what it, what constitutes a land acknowledgement. It's, um, I think that was really, I think that's where people need to like start to move. Like, you're, like you were saying, like, okay, first it's speaking the, speaking the words of like acknowledging the wrongdoings and then it's taking action and like paying people to do a blessing or bringing them to the table or giving 
giving something to the com to native community and the first nations of the place like with the portland example um and i think yeah just like the process of what a land acknowledgement can be is always evolving like we're, as native people i feel like we were always we have always been super um you know ingenuitive and we always were very adaptable and so we do that and be inclusive and i'll let you talk jack <laughs> yeah yeah i really like to say how, how being like ingenuity and being adaptable and about how it's about like maybe maybe imagining imagining like what our own our own landscape and just trying to imagine what that could be i think that's that's really important too um yeah that's all i really have to say is that it's i think that's that's more important than than you know than some big like words or or something yeah does that yeah. make sense Oh, no, for sure. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, sort of like the imagining like indigenous futurisms. Yeah. Um, sort of concept, which is, <laughs> yeah, it's like, I mean, yeah, in some ways, like looking at what, like what my ancestors went through, I'm like, you know what? We're the strongest people out there. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, well, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> Like we can we pretty much adapted and survived through like the worst things that could be thrown at you. So Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, and also to anyone who is watching and works for a land trust, I'm just going to call out land trust in particular. You own a lot of land. Consider it. <laughs> um okay, well we're we're about like 710, so do we want to potentially answer some questions? I can moderate them if you'd like. Yeah, Kim, would you like to? Sure. Um, okay. One has a vote, so we'll do that one. You mentioned earlier that your art, or you mentioned earlier that for your art, you draw from both style as well as styles from other coastal nations. You also mentioned that there are missing pieces of art and culture due to colonization. What has the journey been like for you to find artistic style despite those missing pieces? <laughs> um, yeah, and so I can sort of, I mean, I think there's a couple things in there that maybe points I didn't necessarily expand on. I know early on I sort of mentioned the button blanket being a thing. Um, and button blankets, that's what I was wearing in that first photo that I showed. Um, and just sort of acknowledging that button blankets were a like a post colonization art form um, in which we using um, trade blankets as a way to sort of create regalia. Um, it was also something that came out of Alaska, but has sort of moved its way down to the coast. So we use them a lot in Kulut. Um, like Kulut's use them a lot, even though it's not, um, it's a little bit more of an Alaskan thing. It's something that has slowly migrated its way southwards almost. Um, and then sort of in terms of thinking about, um, yeah thinking about sort of the missing pieces of art and culture. Um, what I would say is that actually, it's been a lot of my um, family, like my like grandparents' generation that did a lot of that work in terms of trying to fill the gaps that were left. Um, definitely after like the boarding school era, which at least for the Kuliu tribe happened during sort of my great grandmother's generation. Um, Ours happened a little bit earlier and stopped a little earlier than it did for some um, tribes. But my grandparents and them sort of using, and also like my aunts and uncles, even that sort of overlap between those two generations, um, kind of 
trying to do some like sharing among like internally within the tribe, trying to start like sort of like secret drum groups, um, sort of like keep the songs alive that we had. Um, but then also there was a lot of information missing. So also, you know, sort of calling on sort of like family members that we had from like Macaw um, and some of the tribes further up on Vancouver Island and sort of um, working with them to figure out like, you know, maybe no one in the tribe remembered how to do like a certain dance. Um, but A, seeing if like other tribes remembered seeing those Kulu dances or even sort of like working with people um, who knew dances from their tribes um, and sort of adapting them into a way that is now Kulu. So I don't know that sort of makes sense, but because there was a lot of like gaps there, we sort of, you know, had to sort of come together more broadly than just within our tribe um, to sort of try and rebuild um, sort of each other, like strengthen, I guess, maybe not rebuild. Rebuild is a little strong, strong of a word. Um, but sort of strengthen like the, what was remaining. Um, yeah. Jack, do you want to answer that? Like, how do you? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, sure. So this question talks about missing pieces of, of art and, and culture. I mean, I'm not really sure what you mean. You mean like by missing, like, like you mean like from contemporary? Um, um I think like how you maybe how you have learned about your cultural art and how because like okay a lot, a lot of times we don't have like the teaching yeah. that we would love to have. Mm hmm I'm not yeah, I guess um well I think it's not so much about what's missing. It's just um, more about like like creating creating our uh, uh, um, a, a new and our new traditions. Like like I think that's that's very it's very possible now is to is to create new traditions. <laughs> you know that the old. You know, it's like old traditions are are forgotten. You know, well, there's constant change in in, in creating new traditions. So um, I guess I guess for me, me personally, like uh, like I I grew up um, urban. You know, um, you know, kind of in and uh, you know in the Seattle area, and you know, like a lot of the you know, the culture around me, you know, they, they, they tried to assimilate me, um, I guess, but I've continued to try and create new connections to, to my in indigenous relations and, and, um, yeah. So I guess how, how I specifically became interested in, in photography, well, I guess I can talk about that. Is that, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sure. Um, so yeah, it was just just when I was growing up, I I like um, I every day I I would like to you know walk walk along you know like the urban beach you know there's like train tracks and everything and I would walk by there every day and I mean you know like in, in high school like I took a photography class and I got really into like um, take photographing like that that landscape and I guess um, uh, it wasn't until later that I guess I started started thinking about more about how like the idea of, of landscape is, is sort of like a construction itself and um, that really kind of inspired me to sort of incorporate that into my photography and, and to draw attention to that and so to sort of create a, a, a new tradition of like constructing our own our own landscapes and, yeah and i guess i feel like 
like, yeah, I mean, sure. And then I'm maybe, maybe I've forgotten all these old, um, these old pieces of, of like Duwamish art and culture, but, but I'm doing what I can, my new traditions to make sure that, um, that, you know, my culture, it's, it's not forgotten and trying to make that very specific. So, yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, you know, I haven't, I haven't talked about my drag very much in this thing since it's not really what the yeah. talk is about, but like definitely when you sort of talk about creating new traditions and stuff, mm -hmm. like that's oftentimes what I've sort of talked about with like my drag performances is just being, um, you know, we might not know anymore, like what queer people thought of like queer um, people, um, sort of like what our traditions around that were, but sort of being able to root the art that I do um, of drag in like the knowledge I do have about like Kuala culture and sort of being able to like build sort of this new, um, sort of being able to kind of like reimagine um, what that would have looked like um, sort of like pre-colonization, like what those beliefs might have been, sort of like rebuilding that based on like what I, what knowledge I do have um and then yeah where else is it going to go with that yeah i'm just creating like new ceremonies i mean often like i people who sort of see my drag performance is like that's different than drag it's something else and it's like and i think it is a little bit because it is sort of this at least for me and for a lot of people who watch it like this new style of ceremony yeah obviously. yeah i think that's very important is it has to it's about that's really how you like create i think something that can really stand up on its on its own is if is if you have to really think about like creating your own traditions. The new tradition. That makes sense. Yeah. I so love I think how both of you use technology or like modern technology for in your work, in mm -hmm. your part of your medium. It's just like oh, you know, yeah. nail so well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, especially like also too, like I know people who are, are trying to like revitalize like like indigenous languages by, by you know like by, like having podcasts and things like that. And I think it's it's very, very important. Like that's not how language was transmitted, you know, way back when, but but now you have to you have to create a new tradition so that so that it, you know, it's an old tradition it's not forgotten. Yeah. Do we want to answer one more question, or what do you think? Sure. Um, yeah. Sure. Um, may I make a suggestion for which one? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kim, do you see the one from Rowdy? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Our brother Rowdy wrote a question. Thanks for being here tonight. Um, okay. If you had all the land that your hearts desired, um, ooh, crap. if you had all the land that your hearts desired where you didn't have to worry about cost or money, what would you imagine doing? Mr. Constructed Landscapes and Mr. Planner. <laughs> <laughs> right, urban planning backgrounds. Um, so I think, I mean, two things. Um, I feel like one, I mean, especially thinking about, I mean, for those of you who don't know Chief Seattle Club, look them up, look into the work they're doing, it's great. Um, but, and just also sort of the conversations that they've had sort of around like, you know, like no, like back in sort of our communities, like no one was homeless, like that wasn't a thing. Um, so I think that would be a huge thing to tackle if I had all the land and the money I could possibly have. Um, 
I think that'd be a big issue. And like thinking about how we sort of do that. Um, I think in that case, I'd probably just give the land and money to the Seattle Club and be like, go for it. Um, another sort of thing that I've, one thing, it's a part of like Coast Salish land management, or I'll just say actually coastal native more broadly, um, land management and the way we sort of manage camas fields is something that I've been thinking about a lot recently. Um, and that is, I know there's some like really cool work going on up in, I believe it's Swinomish is doing some really cool like restoration work in that sense of trying to bring that indigenous, like that food source back. Um, and so I think, yeah, we'll cook those two. Those sound good, right? <laughs> okay, so I guess I, I, I interpreted this question a little bit differently. That's okay. However, you want to answer it. <laughs> so basically, I I saw this about like being about like where like a land where you know I don't have to worry about cost or money. I just that made me think it's like some sort of utopia, you know. Hmm. <laughs> but I don't know. I, I I feel like so. I don't know. I think I'd probably. I lived in like some sort of utopia where I didn't have to worry about uh, uh, money, I guess. Maybe I, I'd probably be trying to do something similar as to now, I guess. I, I don't know. I think I, there's always something to, uh, to you know, expose or, or push back against. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, trying to create new traditions. Yeah, probably be doing the same thing. Hey, all, I am just popping on Megan to go. We do have a double header tonight. Um, so I want to allow uh, time for um, Kim, if you want to um, have a final thought on that question, please do, or any final thoughts. We do have to have a hard close at, uh, in about four minutes. <laughs> um, so just wanted to pop in to say that. Um, Um, okay, I will just say, try to keep it short, like, for sure, restoration, you know, taking a lot of times when I'm working on architectural projects, like, we'll be like, oh, let's do this awesome landscape feature and try to de-urbanize the site. But, you know, there's not enough funds and there's always just the the man-made structure always takes priority over the landscape. So if we could attain land and um, as a community and be able to regenerate it and construct it with this holistic way of um, making it, making it, you know, sustainable with the environment that that's how I love to approach design and what I'd love to do with a piece of land. And then also just creating spaces for us to learn more um, and produce, learn about, you know, our plant and um, animal ecology and how to, how to connect resources to um, sustain ourselves and carry on our our past life ways, our existing life ways, and our future life ways. Can I change my answer? <laughs> okay, so I thought about this a little more, and I feel like I work best with constraints. So I would just be totally lost at sea without any constraints. That's my answer. <laughs> 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 I loved your answer though, because that's like what I feel like COVID's really amplified that the need yeah. to just be able to exist and not have to worry about money and just mm -hmm. have that are like the necessity so we can really absorb our family and our traditions and just not be so burdened with 
the woes of, <laughs> of capitalism. <laughs> yes, but I, I hope that there'd still be some sort of constraint because I, I wouldn't. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> we need but, we need deadlines. You know, they help us. Yeah. Always too. <laughs> we need the seasons to like be like. Yeah. Okay. You can't gather the choke cherries anymore. You're done. Yeah, yeah. There would, there would need to be some sort of other thing. I need to imagine some other, some other way of like putting constraints on my work. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, before we have our hard sign off, <laughs> um, yeah, I just want to thank you both, uh, Kim and Jack, for uh, Kim and Jack for joining us. Um, yeah, and. Just, yeah, always makes me feel better to be not the only Indigenous person in the room. So, yeah, I just want to thank you both so much for being a part of this um, and joining my soapbox speech. <laughs> thank you. I, I want to just say on behalf of Town Hall, thank you all so much for being here and for giving us the space and time to think about, you know, how we can, um, as an organization, move beyond just acknowledging and actually take it to action. So I think this will be great to sort of Start that conversation and um thank you so much Haley for your um your your artwork that'll be very exciting to see in the building so um thank you all so much have a great night uh and we'll see you see you again soon thank you <laughs>